I mean, no, you, no. See, you see, even even evangelicals will <coughs> talk about how you know the law kept people in bondage, and the New yeah. Testament now we we're, we, we're free from that law. It's we're circumcised in the heart. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We don't need no. the Torah. Yeah. And like, that's sort of Marcionite in a little bit of a way, yeah. right? Well, you know, the other way Christians are Marcionite today is that Marcions said that since the creator who made this world, the material world, was not the true God, not the God of Jesus, Jesus could not belong to the creator God, which means Jesus couldn't have a material body. Jesus was God. He wasn't, he, he seemed like a human, but it was just an appearance. And today, if I ask my students, you know, they'd say, yeah, well, Jesus was God. Well, was he really a human? Well, he's kind of a human, but they don't really think he was a human being. And so uh, that's Marcy and I. Yeah, you get, you get one of these like things that defy mathematics when you say he's 100% God and 100% man. It's like, how can you be 100% of any two things? Yeah, yeah, right. And how can you have a trinity where the three are all equally God? They're all they're different persons. All three of them, they're equally God, and there's only one God. Well, that, right. this is how Christian theology developed, and it it's, it's interesting in its way because it's very paradoxical and to that extent, it's actually quite sophisticated, but it, yeah, it doesn't make mathematical sense. <laughs> yeah. And so it's funny because you hear about different denominations today and you, you look at Mormons compared to Catholics or evangelicals compared to Orthodox, Greek, whatever. Yeah. And you think they're so far apart. Yeah. If you compare them to the Marcionites and the Ebionites, they're actually closer together because they yeah. at least agree on who Jesus was, which yeah. is a big deal. They agree on who Jesus. There, there are all sorts of things they have in common that are different from these most of these ancient groups. I mean, you know, Greek Orthodox and Mormons when they talk about the New Testament, they've got the same twenty-seven books in their New Testaments. I mean, you know, and, and Marcion didn't. Marcion had a canon of only eleven books. He didn't have any Old Testament. He had some Gospels, kind of like our. It was like our Luke, and he had ten of Paul's letters. That was it. So you know. Very, very different. Okay, so the, let's get into the Gnostics a little bit because I am I am the Gnostic informant, so we should talk about yeah, that. You talk about is that, that is that really is were, were, were people calling themselves Gnostics or is this a later term that we used to to defi define groups? Was that really a thing or no? The term Gnostic was used. Uh, we don't know that Gnostic groups used it of themselves. Their opponents used it of Gnostics, and okay. there actually were proto-Orthodox Christians like Clement of Alexandria, who considered himself a Gnostic, because the word Gnostic simply means somebody who knows. To it know. comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means know, to know, to know. And so Gnostics were, there are ver various groups of Gnostics. The, the differences among them, just like the Greek Orthodox versus the Mormons, I mean, they're very different. But they did agree that knowledge was the way of salvation and that it's not Christ's death that brings about salvation. It's the secret knowledge that he revealed. And he revealed how people can understand uh, the, the world and reality and who they really are so that they can escape the material trappings of this world to, to, to return to the spiritual home they came from. Yeah. And you can see in the writings of Paul, why this is, um, considered her heretical because Paul talks about knowledge being insufficient and that even he even gets into being works being insufficient. It's all about faith. And then you write, and then you go a couple, couple books later, you get to James and James is like, well, it's about, it's about works. You, yeah. uh, he's, he calls him like a, you idiot or something. He says something like that. And then you could kind of tell, I think, if, and correct me for what you think, if you disagree or not, I think he's talking to Paul. It looks like he's talking to Paul. I have a so I, I I thought that for a long time. I actually have a different view of that now, which is close a close view to that. I think that actually I don't think James and Paul are disagreeing. I think what's going on is that James is disagreeing with later Christians who took Paul's teachings to an extreme. Okay. What Paul taught was that a person cannot be made right with God by doing the works of the law. By that he meant. You can't become right with God by being, becoming Jewish. Becoming Jewish ain't going to get you there. So the works of the law for Paul means like things like getting circumcised and keeping kosher and observing the Sabbath. Doing that stuff's not going to put you in the right relation. You've got to have faith with Christ. So he had this thing about works of the law. But later Paul and Christians said, you can't be right with God by doing works. And they appear to me like doing good things. And you find that already in the New Testament. The book of Ephesians claims to be written by Paul. It almost certainly was not written by Paul. The guy who wrote Ephesians thought that, that you can't be saved by doing good things. James is attacking that. 
Right. That makes sense. That's a, that's a good way to look yeah. at it. So it's, I, it's a Pauline form of Christianity, but I don't think it's exactly how Paul would have put it. Yeah. And uh, I mean, so I, I, it seems to me that Christianity is sort of like a, like you sort of get handed down these concepts from like the Gnosis. Pythagoras wrote about Gnosis. I think Plato did too. Concept like the logos that Philo is talking about. Yeah. And, um, it seems like the uh, the back and forth in the in the epistles that p- p- people call contradictions. I used to think that it was one of my like, oh look, the Bible contradicts itself. But now I'm sort of seeing it's more like a Platonic, not a dialogue, but like a like here's different situations and here's uh-huh. how you handle these situations. Uh-huh. And uh-huh. Sort, it's sort of it's that's how it's put put together. On yeah. Purpose. Well, I think it's a helpful way to look at it. I mean, I do think, you know, there are obvious contradictions, I think, in my opinion, but but a lot of it is kind of dialogical. Um, and But the dialogical aspect of it shows that um, people have different perspectives and they're trying to they're trying to feed off of different perspectives and trying to provide more nuance and they're trying to. And so it isn't it isn't kind of a black and white thing that, you know. Uh, this author says this, and then this author completely contradicts. Sometimes it happens, especially in narratives, especially like in the Gospels, you know, where you, you've got two accounts of Jesus doing something. You just can't reconcile them no matter how much you try. But um, uh, but a lot of times you're, it's it's what you're saying. They're playing off of each other. Yeah. So I got one minute left. So I'm going to say in conclusion, I think it's safe to say that I think Christians today should sort of take for granted take for granted the fact that to be a christian you have to believe x y and z about jesus you have to believe that he died that he resurrected that he was that he's god whatever but back in the, the earlier before the church became the uh state religion you didn't have to there wasn't no you didn't have to believe anything you just you just belong to a certain group and that's the way it was yeah the way i guess i would put that is before you start getting these creeds develop in the fourth century you have different groups that had different beliefs and there was no there was no standard um but of course you know in the fourth century they started developing creeds like the nicene creed where uh, we believe in god the father almighty maker of heaven and earth and you know like you got to say this right and so it becomes more standardized even when you make it standardized though of course people interpret it in different ways and that's why you get the mormons and the greek orthodox <laughs> they're still very different from each other yeah uh, but- but it is it is more unified now, I think, than it was. <laughs> yeah, I would agree. And uh, thanks for thanks for uh, coming on. And everybody, right. the links in the description for the webinar, and go check that out. And you have just attained true gnosis. <laughs> <laughs>